The one who tells the stories rules the world. Hopi proverb. Oh, hi. Mr. Lahasky here. And today we're opening the U.S. history course with a discussion of pre-Columbian North America. While the course you're taking is United States history, we'll be taking some time in these first few weeks to look at the developments that ultimately led to the establishment of the United States. That will entail a brief survey of the people who inhabited this continent long before our country's founders. And indeed, the first Americans will play instrumental roles in colonial America and United States history. But before we dive into their societies, we need to answer a big question that remains relevant to this day. How should we refer to the American Indian? You've likely heard the first Americans referred to in a number of different ways. Indians, Native Americans, First Nations, Amerind, Indigenous peoples, and the list goes on. So what should we say? As is often the case, the best answer is, it depends. But a few general rules should apply. Rule number one, if you're not a member of the group you're naming, listen first and defer to their preference. A quick example to illustrate this point. If I know a student in my class goes by the name Alex, but I defiantly call him Alexander because I think it suits him better, and this causes the student to become upset or offended, who's the jerk? It's me. Our names are so closely tied to our sense of identity. So in order to respect the person or group we're dealing with, we need to respect their preferred name. So what is the preferred name of the group in question? Unfortunately, we don't have a clear answer for that either. And the reason why is today's first big idea. The tribal nations of North America were, and still are, extremely diverse. The area that now consists of the United States was once home to more than 500 tribes who spoke hundreds of languages, practiced scores of religions, and utilized dozens of political systems. Using broad terms like American Indian or Native American implies that the first Americans were a monolith, which simply isn't true. It's natural that the descendants of these diverse peoples should have different identities and different preferences, and indeed they do. A 1995 Department of Labor study found that of several hundred indigenous people surveyed, 49.8% preferred the term American Indian, while 37.5% preferred Native American. In the 25 years since that study, preferences have continued to evolve. In 1998, after a year of discussion and debate, an indigenous student advocacy group at the University of Kansas changed its name from the Native American Student Association to First Nations Student Association. Meanwhile, just across town in Lawrence, the self-proclaimed premier tribal university in the United States has retained the name Haskell Indian Nations University. Generally speaking, it is acceptable to use the term Native American, American Indian, First Nations, or Indigenous people. But that's not a hard and fast rule, and could very well change in the future. So always remember to listen first and defer. But often there's a better option, and that brings us to rule number two. Whenever possible, use specific tribal names. The historical record is not perfect, but in many cases it reveals the specific tribe or nation that American colonists and later American citizens had dealings with. In order to respect the diversity of First Nations people, use the name preferred by that tribe. This map is a helpful resource and it contains the preferred tribal names alongside their approximate homeland. I'll include a link below. And that brings us to rule number three. Recognize and avoid racist terminology unless quoting directly or critiquing as a historian. In order to decode the truth of the past, we must rely on primary sources. And when dealing with these sources, we will inevitably encounter language that is antiquated and sometimes discomforting. In colonial documents, one of the most common terms used to refer to the American Indian was savage. Used as both a noun and an adjective, this inherently racist term was employed to characterize indigenous people as a lower order of human. It stemmed from a deep misunderstanding of native customs and culture. Redskin is another name that falls in this category. The slur was used as late as the 1800s to advertise bounties for which American settlers could receive cash for the murder of American Indians on the frontier. These terms and others like them should only be used if quoted directly from a primary source or as part of critique. For example, if our purpose in a discussion or paper is to trace the racist origin of the word savage, 
That would be difficult to accomplish without mention of the word itself. We should not, however, use antiquated language freely simply because it used to be commonplace. In keeping these three guidelines, we can confront the unpleasant parts of our past accurately while still preserving the dignity of the people whose ancestors we study. So let's dive in and take a closer look at Native American society on the eve of European arrival. Building on the principle of tribal diversity, our second big idea will guide the next part of the discussion. Native American societies were shaped by the geographical features of the continent. Diverse geographical features yielded diverse societies. It's easy to take for granted how much geography affects our culture, but it does. Just consider our society's relationship with food. In the Gulf South and Northeast, seafood reigns supreme, and many Southern traditions and celebrations coincide with the seasons best for fishing. Here in the Midwest, one of the biggest parties of the year is the American Royal Barbecue Competition, a celebration of meat from the grazing pastures of the Great Plains. Food has always played a defining role in culture and societal makeup, and that was especially true prior to advances in shipping and transportation. Native American societies were built around a tribe's food source, and those food sources varied with their geography. As we look closer at American Indian societies and their particular processes for food, we can draw another conclusion, which will be our third big idea. The more abundant and reliable a tribe's food source, the more complex and specialized tribal society became. This is a simple but intuitive anthropological principle. When food is scarce, most of a society's time and energy is spent procuring the next meal. When food is plentiful, more energy and resources can be devoted to things like art, recreation, and religion. A quick tour around North America can supply us with a number of examples of this principle. The Ute or Nunsi tribes settled in what is now western Colorado, Utah, New Mexico, and Nevada, a desert region now known as the Great Basin. The geography of this region did not lend itself to agriculture, so the Nunsi were a nomadic hunting and gathering people who moved their villages with the season. Because so much time and energy was dedicated to food procurement in the Great Basin, the Nunsi settled in smaller bands and family units. There was not much specialization within Nunsi society. Men were hunters and warriors, while women were in charge of educating the young, maintaining the household, and making most of the tribe's clothing and tools. Nunsi housing was temporary, and the tribe's survival depended on their use of a complex trail network throughout the Great Basin. Similar to the Great Basin tribes were the American Indians of the Great Plains. In the absence of modern farming and irrigation techniques, the soil and climate of the plains could not sustain agriculture. As a result, the tribes of the Great Plains were also nomadic. Their lifeline was the buffalo, and the animal provided food, clothing, housing, and materials for tools. Buffalo were abundant on the plains, but were not always accessible. The tribes of the Sioux Nation, the Dakota, Lakota, and Nakota, lived in temporary homes called teepees and followed the herds throughout the year. While the Sioux tribes were extensive, the demands of the nomadic lifestyle required all members to contribute to the survival of the community, and specialization within the society was rare. As we move to other geographic regions, we find American Indian tribes with more reliable food processes, and consequently, increased specialization and societal complexity. The American Southwest was home to a number of major tribes that included the Diné or Navajo, and Pueblo nations. Despite the arid climate of the Southwest, these nations did have a geographic advantage that allowed their society to flourish, their proximity to Mexico. When maize agriculture spread north from Mesoamerica, the Native Americans of the Southwest were its first recipients. Over the centuries, they developed irrigation practices that allowed the crop to thrive. Maize provided a reliable food source that could sustain villages year-round, and it opened the door for permanent dwellings and population growth. Archaeologists have also uncovered brilliant pottery and art created by southwestern tribes. The presence of art and artisans in Pueblo and Diné societies serves as evidence of a complex, specialized society, one that was not yet feasible on the Great Plains. 
As we move along on our tour of North America, we find more evidence of tribes with well-established food processes and complex societies. The Mississippi River Valley was home to a number of tribes known by archaeologists as the Mound Builders. Large earthen platforms were hallmarks of the Mississippian culture, which includes well-known tribes like the Choctaw and Chickasaw. These mounds suggest a high degree of specialization, stability, and complexity within the settlements. It's widely accepted that the mounds were built for spiritual or ceremonial purposes. Now, a society that can devote such manpower and resources to the construction of these earthworks clearly had priorities beyond finding food for their next meal. Indeed, these societies benefited from the fertile soil of the Mississippi River Valley and developed agriculture that was reliable enough to sustain large populations. The largest Mississippian settlement, Cahokia, near present-day St. Louis, was believed to be the home of over 40,000 residents at its peak. It was the largest such city in North America. Native American tribes in the Northeast were also very successful. The region's climate permitted agriculture during the summer months, while waterways, lakes, and woodlands provided ample fishing and hunting to sustain tribes throughout the year. Settlements were permanent and characterized by large dwellings called longhouses that were made of timber. The most famous of the Northeast woodland tribes were the Iroquois nations, which consisted of the Mohawk, Oneida, Cayuga, Seneca, and Onondaga. The complexity and specialization in this society is evidenced by the political alliance forged by the Five Nations, which is believed to be the only pre-Columbian North American empire. Rather than be forced to compete with each other for a limited food supply, the stability of Iroquois food processes permitted the specialization, joint protection, and even expansion of their societies. Our final stop on this tour is the Pacific Northwest, home to the Chinook. This tribe was religiously and politically complex. A strict social caste system organized Chinook society. Tribal warriors and religious leaders occupied the upper class. Then there was a second class of commoners and even an enslaved class. This degree of specialization suggests that the Chinook had very stable food sources, and indeed they did. The forests of the Northwest provided ample game for hunting and the waterways offered some of the best fishing on the continent. As we can see, the dynamic geographic characteristics of present-day United States had major effects on Native American societies, societies which varied significantly from region to region. However, the people of the First Nations did have some similarities as well, and these similarities would later highlight European observation and evaluation of American Indians. Most Native American tribes were matrilineal. This means they traced their family lineage through the ancestry of the mothers. Second, while religious practices among the tribes were diverse, most Native American spiritual beliefs were animistic and focused on the power and importance of nature. These similarities, notable though they are, pale in comparison to the rich diversity of Native American culture that predates European arrival. When Christopher Columbus and subsequent European explorers established settlements on American lands, it forever changed the trajectory of both European and Native American history. But more on that next time. See you then.